I want to go over lectures 21 through 27, the quizzes that cover the content that's going to be on test three, including two quizzes we did not end up taking. So let's start with lecture 21. So you know that 70% of your customers report being satisfied historically, but now you've made this new customer relationship strategy. You're hoping that it raises their um, satisfaction rate. So you do a study, you take 30 to 38 customers and 36 of them report being satisfied. You're going to do a hypothesis test to see if this gives evidence at the 2% level that the new strategy leads to a customer satisfaction rate higher than what it was in the past, 70%. When you do this, you get a p-value of 1.6%. So the variable, the thing that you're going to record about each individual, individuals or customers, right, because you took a sample of customers, so you're going to ask them, are you satisfied? So whether each customer is satisfied under this new relationship model is the variable, the question about each individual. Because that's a yes or no question, the parameter is going to be a proportion. That is the only parameter we have ever looked at for a yes or no question. Proportion of what? Proportion of all the population, remember, is all customers. That's, we took a sample of customers, of 38 customers, that's the sample. Population is customers. So the parameter is the proportion of all customers who are satisfied under the new model. And then the alternate hypothesis, remember that's the thing that comes after that. Test at the 2% level that this new strategy leads to an overall customer satisfaction rate higher than the traditional 70%. Um, that is exactly C. So the p-value, recall, was 1.6%, and our significance level is 2.2%. So the p-value is less than the significance level. That means it is significant at the 2% level. And then our conclusion is this data is significant evidence at the 2% level. We know it's that, so we can stop. We already see it has to be B. Because we got significant evidence, it is evidence that the customer relations, customer strategy helped. Okay. So that was all hypothesis testing in the abstract. Now in lecture 22, we are going to look at uh, proportions, testing about a single proportion in a single population. In this case, we have 1,100 individuals from a population, nine answered yes. We want to test the claim, there's a typo there, at the 5% significance level that less than 2% of the entire population would answer yes to this question. So the significance level, of course, is listed there as 5%. This, the alternate hypothesis is that less than 2% of the population would answer yes to this question. So the proportion who would answer yes to this question is less than 2%. Right? Alternate hypotheses about a proportion can be P is different from, greater than, less than a number, but here it is less than 2%. The sample proportion P hat is 9 divided by 1100. So I'm going to do that in Excel. 9 divided by 1100 is 0 0.00818, which as a percentage is 8.18%. Okay. Percentage, two decimals. We need the p-value, a percentage to two decimals. So recall, we want p is less than 2%. So we're going to use normdist, 0.02, will be our test proportion. So the first slot, we put our p hat, which we already figured out. The second slot, we put our test proportion. In the third slot, we put the standard error using the test proportion. In general, in hypothesis testing, when you need to you, when you would like to use P, the true proportion, you use the test proportion. 
So we have p, which is 0 0.02, times 1 minus p, which is 0 0.98, divided by the sample size, which is 1,100. We close off that square root. You take the square root of everything. Make sure you get your parentheses right. The ritualistic 1 at the end. I will pause a second and then press return. And I get a p-value of 0 0.002557. If you sometimes mess up converting to decimals, you can always, or converting to percentages, sorry, you can always just highlight the cell, um, go to home, click on the number, and say I want to express it as a percentage, and you can set how many decimal places. Yeah. Okay, so percentage to two decimal places, 0.82, and for p hat and 0.26. Um, ooh, good thing I caught that, right? 0.82% and the p hat was 0.26%. Okay, so I made that, I made exactly the mistake I was warning you about. That was not theatrical, I really did. And you can use Excel to make sure you're converting to a decimal and doing the right des and rounding off correctly. Okay, p-value 0.26% is less than the significance level, which was 5%. So that means it is significant. This data is significant evidence, blah -de blah -de blah I don't ask you to check the assumptions, but I do note that the rule of 15 is subtle here, because n times p hat, which is what we would use in a confidence interval, is 9 and fails it. But in a hypothesis test, you use n times p0. So that's 1100 times 0 0.02, which is, you can do in your head, 22. And that meets the assumption. Okay, now we will move on to lecture 23, where we test for a mean. <clears throat> do a hypothesis test about a mean would be a better way to say it. So I tell you that the average American college student skips four classes a week, and now we're going to look at a data column B of alcohol skip classes, interpret that as a sample of Fairfield U students, where the variable was how many classes did you skip, and we're going to ask, is this evidence at the 1% level that Fairfield U students are different in their class skipping habits from typical college students. So notice the population is Fairfield U students. All college students just is giving us that comparison number of four. For a one sample mean, the alternate hypothesis is always mu is less than greater than different from some value. So mu is, in this case, we said different. So we use not equal. And the mu zero, the test value, is four. To find the p-value, we have to go and get the data. And that is uh, not showing up. Alcohol skips classes. Column B. We highlight. We copy. There we go. And then we go to the one sample T procedure. I already have it teed up here to save us time. We click on column A and we paste. That doesn't look right. Let's try that again. Something went wrong there. Alcohol skips classes. Column B. There we go. Now I've copied it. Now I paste into A. And I can see my data is in column A. And because I'm a little nervous, I'm going to go and check. X bar is 3.31. That seems pretty reasonable, right? We are, we're comparing it to four classes skip per week. If you look at those numbers, they are tend to be two, three, four. Um, and my sample size is 127. All right, so we want evidence that the average in our population 
is different from 4. So we're going to take 4 as our test mean and mean not equal to test mean as our um, alternate hypothesis. And that gives us a p-value of 0 0.002508 or 0.2508%. And we did need four decimal places and a percentage, no, a percentage, so it's 0 0.0025 because it's a decimal. Okay, that p-value is less than 1%. So this is significant evidence that, what was the alternate hypothesis? Fairfield U students are different in their class skipping habits from typical college students. Um, so the average classes skipped of all Fairfield U students is different from the average for all college students. We are comparing the population we are thinking about, Fairfield U students, to this population we happen to know about. Okay, again, I didn't ask you to check the assumptions, but I did ask you to notice something about the 0, 15, 40 rule, which is that in fact, on this histogram, this histogram is pretty skewed and certainly not unimodal. Um, so if we also are not told the variable is normal, so if the sample size were less than 40, we would fail the 0, 15, 40 rule. But it's not. In fact, we can see the sample size is 127. And I want you to notice I looked on the, the um, T distribution page to figure out, <coughs> excuse me, the sample size. Um, many people looked at the file and just looked at the last line, which was 128, and did not notice there was a heading so that going to 128 meant 127 data points. So you want to be careful and looking at the, um, where the, the T procedure compute figures out N, you can take as pretty reliable. Okay, so far I have not made any mistakes I didn't catch. We'll see how long that lasts. We did not do lecture 24, but it's a very important one. So let's do it now. So the setup is when you give blood, they test the blood for antibodies that indicates various infections, such as HIV. And effectively, they're doing a hypothesis test. The alternate hypothesis is that you are infected with HIV. So that means the null hypothesis is you are not, or your blood is not. So imagine that they test at the 5% level. And of course, what happens is if they find significant evidence that your blood is infected, they throw it out. And if not, they use it. A type 2 error, remember, is um, a situation where the alternate hypothesis is true, but you fail to find evidence for it. So the alternate hypothesis is true is you or your blood is infected with HIV. So the blood is infected, but they do not find significant evidence. So two things say the blood is in, oops, two things say the blood is infected, A and D, but A says the blood is infected and the test does not give significant evidence. Um, so that is the type two error. Then I suggest a p-value, 0.0065, that is less than the 5% significance level. So this data is significant evidence that the blood is infected. And then if this is an error, a type two error we just saw was the alternate hypothesis is true, but the test does not give significant evidence. So this can't be a type two error. If this is an error, that means it's wrong, which means that the blood is not infected. If the null hypothesis is true, but you find significant evidence, that is a type one error. Okay, so that's all about distinguishing, distinguishing type one and type two in a real situation. You will have to do that on the test. Another interpretive question is about the significance level. You will have to do something about this on the test. In this case, 
If many of these blood donations are tested at this significance level, what percentage of good blood samples would be thrown out incorrectly? Good means uninfected, means null hypothesis is true, and thrown out means you found significant evidence. What percentage of situations where the null hypothesis is true will you find significant evidence? That is exactly what the significance level is, and that is 5%. Okay, so we made a mistake here. All right, let's see. It's very hard to do online tests. I said it out loud, but I was still not saying it correctly. <laughs> All right, but I was still not clicking correctly. The blood is infected, but the test does not give significant evidence. That is the correct answer, and I don't know why I didn't um, type it. So I'm going to say it again. Type 2 error, alternate hypothesis is true, but you do not get significant evidence. So blood is infected, but you do not get significant evidence. That's D. Okay. Let's do lecture 25 which is two sample proportion. Here's our Kesha question. We take a simple random sample of 60 pop singers and we ask, what do you use to brush your teeth? And whether you have gotten any cavities. That's two binary categorical variables, which we know means you use the two sample proportion test. We're going to test at the 3.3% level that there is a relationship between what you use to brush your teeth, toothpaste or jack, and getting cavities. So the way I chose to express that was I looked at the proportion of toothpaste users who got cavities and the proportion of jack users who got cavities. You can do any version of that you like. So, the, so it's proportion, which means it can't be A, two proportions, it can't be E, and not equals, because we're looking for a difference. So it is the proportion of toothpaste users who got cavities is different from the proportion of jack users who got cavities. So we're going to put this into the two sample template. There were 39 toothpaste users and 21 jack users. 5 and 11 got cavities respectively. So that's what I'm going to put in. And I am going to go to the two sample proportion test. Thirty nine toothpaste users, five got cavities, and twenty one toothpaste users, eleven got cavities. If you had done instead successes was not getting cavities or if you had distinguished people who got cavities in the first column and people who didn't in the second column and success was using toothpaste, all of these will get you the same answer. If there's a direction, you have to be careful about which what's the right direction. But in this case, um, we had a, we're looking for the two-tailed alternate hypothesis. The two proportions are different. So we use this p-value, 0.00095. It is very small p-value. So that's going to be 0.095%. So 0 0.0095. That is significant, right? It is a very small p-value, less than 3%. Significant evidence at the 3% level that, what was the alternate hypothesis? There's a relationship between the choice and cavities. So choice is related to getting cavities. Simple random sample, I didn't even bother asking. It's met. Large population, we need there to be more than 20 times the sample size. Sample size is 60. So 1,200 pop stars in the world. The rule of 10-5. This test, was it two-tailed or one-tailed? 
we use not equals. So it was two-tailed, which means we need the counts to be more than five. And the counts, here you use the actual number of successes and failures, which are five, 34, 11, and 10. Five, 34, 11, and 10. Notice there is a tie. That's why I said ties are okay. So this is met. Five is greater than or equal to five. Phew. All right. And let us finally, or semi-finally, pen ultimately do lecture 26, which is the two sample mean. So here we're given summary statistics, two samples or one sample of patients broken into two groups, each of 30, so the total is 60. First group got conventional therapy, which is called radiation. And their diameter, their tumors reduced by 17 millimeters with a standard deviation of 15. And here, the bigger that number is, the bigger the reduction in tumor size, the better it's doing, right? Um, and the second group got radiation plus drugs, so we'll call that P drugs, or mu drugs, whatever. And the diameter of the tumor is reduced by an average of 19 millimeters, standard deviation of 19 millimeters. Is the significant evidence at the 2% level that therapy, including drugs, is more effective than conventional therapy? We are comparing two treatments, and we're measuring the treatment with a number, how much it's reduced. So that means we're using two sample mean. Or you could say we're relating the choice of treatment, which is a binary categorical variable, with a numerical variable. That means our parameter is mean, so you can rule out the first two. And we are looking for evidence that the drugs is more effective than conventional radiation therapy. More effective means bigger. So we're looking for evidence that mu drugs is bigger than mu rad, or mu rad is less than mu drugs. So now we need a p-value. So we're going to go to the two sample mean. And the first sample is 17 and 15. So radiation 17, standard deviation of 15. And remember, the sample size was 30. Second sample was drugs. I believe the mean was 19. And I don't remember the standard deviation, but we will check. Mean and standard deviation were 19. And now, hopefully you're all cringing at the fact that I have not yet checked the use summary statistics box until I do. You should feel a deep sense of discomfort there. Everybody can relax. We want evidence that drugs are more effective than radiation. Drugs is second, so we want evidence that the first mean is less than the second mean. We get a p-value of 0.3264. So let's record that as a percentage, that is 32.6. The formal conclusion, the p-value is much bigger than the significance level of 2%, so it is not significant evidence at the 2% level for the alternate hypothesis. What is the alternate hypothesis? That therapy, including drugs, is more effective than conventional therapy, and that is D. Okay? Careful wording here, right, because... There's also therapy is not more effective and more reduction, less reduction. Okay, simple random sample, it says, again, we took one sample of all patients and broke it up into two treatments. So we need the entire population of patients with cancer to be more than 20 times the sample size. Sample size was 60. So that's 1,200. And normality assumption, because there's a numerical variable, we know it's going to be a version of the 0, 15, 40 rule. Um, and the only question is, do we... Um, so 0, 15, 40 could be A or C. 
C treats them as one sample and says, oh, a total of 60 is more than 40 were set. A treats them as two different samples. Remember, that's what we need to do for the 0, 50, and 40 rule. We need a reasonably symmetric histogram or to know the variable is normally distributed. We don't know these, so it does not say. We can't tell whether or not it's met. Okay, last one, lecture 27, chi-squared procedure. And here's our data. We have three professors teaching Western civilization, um, and we're given their grade distribution. So we're given the um, how many A's, B's, C's, and D's or F's are given out by each professor. And notice, it says treat the entire sample as a simple random sample of all college students. That tells you a couple of things. One, that it's a simple random sample. The other is the population is college students. And that means individuals are college students. So what you're recording about each individual is who was your professor, which is a multi-valued categorical, and what was your grade, which is a multi-valued categorical. Relating to multi-valued categorical variables is chi-squared. Um, okay, the alternate hypothesis is there's evidence for that they have different grading distributions, um, and that is D. Okay, three professors have the same grading distribution as the null hypothesis. Professor one grades harder than the others might be true but that is not what we are testing for evidence of. It's more, more specific than the alternate hypothesis we used. So we need to compute the p-value. Notice we're gonna use, I don't know if I can highlight it, only these numbers because the totals do not go into the chi-squared distribution. So first row is seven, 13, and 13. Notice if you were lazy and typed one, two, and three for the three professors, you would um, screw up the test because those would be treated as further data. Um, what about Bs? We had eight, 16, and 15. Eight, 16, eight, 15. Cs, we had five, three, and one. And less than C, we had, oh, sorry, that was 5, 3, and 1. We had 13, 4, and 4. So this is 5, 3, 1. 13, 4, and 4, because I kind of messed that up. I'm going to check. All right. So did I type those all incorrectly? Well, I can look here at the expected column. And it says 33, 36, and 33. That's what the totals are. That leaves me pretty confident. Also, four rows and three columns, that's what I was expecting. Okay, so if I typed it incorrectly, my p-value will almost certainly be correct. My p-value is 1.618%. We just need two decimal places, 1.62%. 1 1.62% is less than 4%. So this data is significant evidence. Um, but A is not quite right. It is significant evidence at the 4% level that the three professors have a different grading distribution. That's B. A says it's significant evidence, but it just says that the p-value is less than the significance level. That is not, you don't need evidence of that. That's a fact. Um, okay, large population. We need the population of all. Now we need to know the population. That's okay. We took a simple random sample of all college students. So we know the, that all college students is the population. Needs to be more than 20 times the sample size. 
adding up these three numbers or looking on the template, you see that's 102. So times 20 is 2040. And then we need that at least 80% of the um, expected cells have counts of at least five. So let's check that out. The use column tells you that it's only 75%. That is less than 80%. So it's not met. So the fact that we're getting the same answer that I wrote there is a good check that you're doing it right. And we did it. Okay, I hope this was helpful to you all. Goodbye.